So during this global pandemic, SARS-2, back with a vengeance, COVID-19, by the layman. <laughs> Anyways, this is the shit that the Supreme Court has handed down during this pandemic. Allen v. Cooper, 2020 decision. This is just, this is our Supreme Court today, and it's going to be Elena Kagan who's going to write the decision. And it's going to go against individuals' right to sue a state for copyright infringement. So they made a wrong decision. This is a terrible decision. This is awful. I mean, this is basically a Schink decision. This is a Dred Scott decision, a Chaplinsky, Plessy v. Ferguson decision. This is going to be a decision where people say that's not even law. That's like, you know, so faux pas and back just way, I can't believe people even thought like that. So 2020, Alan V. Cooper. Again, this is not a list productions. Alan is the main guy. He only has a hook, and he's videotaped Blackbeard's ship for 20 years. For 20 years, he videotaped Blackbeard's ship, but North Carolina thinks that they could use his private images that he videotaped and has a co copyright claim on without paying him. So they're going to private, you know, they're going to pirate his intellectual property without paying for that which they plundered. And that's exactly what one of the damn justices said. So first of all, let's just look at the U.S. Constitution. Does the U.S. Constitution say anything at all about, con you know, um, uh, patents or copyright or intellectual property? Well, apparently, yeah, it does. It's got a patent and copyright and intellectual property clause. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. These are the specific powers. I mean, Congress and the U.S. government, they got implied powers, right? But they have specific powers. The Congress should have the power, Clause 8, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So the U.S. Constitution gives the federal government the right to patent and issue copyrights and intellectual property. So they, they didn't, um, apparently our Supreme Court didn't even consult the U.S. Constitution because there it is, right there, as plain as day. We figured this shit out two year, you know, 200 years ago. But today's Supreme Court isn't even paying attention to, you know, our Constitution. I'm not sure where they're saying the law comes from it's not, if it's not the U.S. Constitution. Allen v. Cooper is even more absurd because it was a unanimous decision against Allen, this poor guy with just a hook, right? How's he going to live? You got North Carolina sitting there robbing him of his intellectual property. I mean, he only has one hand. He took all that time, all them years, all that, you know, money, what, thousands, millions of dollars, who knows how long or expensive a case like this cost. But North Carolina, they won the case because they claimed sovereign immunity. And, of course, Elena Kagan and the rest of the SCOTUS groupies concurred. States can't be held to pay for the plunder that they pirate from protected intellectual property from individuals or corporations. Allen is a corporation, Nautilus Corporation, and the individual. And the reason why is because juries award large sums of money to these cases, and you got libraries and archives and other educational efforts that will be vulnerable to lawsuits. And yeah, libraries do have a lot of copyrighted material, and I would assume archives do too. So that's the holding, that U.S. states are allowed to steal copyrighted material without the fear of reprisal from civil lawsuits of corporations or individual American citizens via the 11th Amendment. And the 11th Amendment is such a dog shit fucking law. The 11th Amendment strikes again because of the 11th Amendment. Frederick Allen has no rights at all, at least not in federal court when it comes to his copyright claims. And therefore, none of us, no American citizens, no corporations, have any rights at all to sue in a federal court against other states or our own state. Now, it also says foreign citizens, so foreigners can't sue Americans or, or states in federal court, but neither can citizens. Citizens cannot use the federal courts to sue other states or the state that we live in. 
So, yeah, states can sue individuals for stealing their intellectual property, but the individual can't do the same in federal courts. Therefore, North Carolina can pirate your stuff, but you cannot pirate North Carolina stuff because they're a bunch of hypocritical pieces of shit. So now, Colorado, Utah, Hawaii, the state of the government, the corporation, however you want to, you know, describe the governor and the court and those, you know, they are now allowed to steal Disney's copyrighted materials, stream them on their state's websites, because corporations, individuals, cannot sue a state and federal court. The Commerce Clause, that abrogates sovereign immunity from the state. Sovereign immunity, what the fuck? Sovereign immunity makes sense in, like, royalist governments with, you know, maybe a constitutional monarchy. But sovereignty only applies for monarchies. Nobody has got sovereign immunity in America. The rule of law says that everybody has to obey the law. So that's, the rule of law is a benchmark of democracy. The Commerce Clause abrogates sovereign immunity of the states from federal courts. So if we're going to entertain this sovereign immunity bullshit, the Bankruptcy Clause, the Commerce Clause, the Post Office Clause, many, many cl Supremacy Clause, Necessary and Proper Clause, the Bill of Rights exception, where they use the 14th Amendment to enforce First Amendment cases, and other Bill of Rights, the right to bear arms and the right to keep soldiers from staying in your house. So this is a terrible decision, absolutely awful decision. They're going to carry on with the legal fiction that states have sovereign immunity. Now, the 11th Amendment, I, I'm afraid that it's, you know, it could be consistent with the 11th Amendment. I don't know. We're not going to talk about the 11th Amendment for right now. Just put the 11th Amendment off to the side for right now. In the U.S. Constitution, it says that Congress has a right to, you know, pass patent laws. In fact, they've been passing copyright laws for 200 years, there's 1790, there's a copyright law. For, so for the most of the hi history of America, copyright law that Congress passes is the law of the land. But for the past 26 years, in modern, in postmodern, in the 2000s, in the millennium, the Supreme Court has been looking at the 11th Amendment and saying, yes, states have sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity. So Frederick Allen... I want to talk a little bit about Frederick Allen. And then I want to talk about 1819 McCulloch v. Maryland. There's another thing that says the federal government has power over the state. Yes, the federal government is allowed to create the Bank of America, and it can land it right on Maryland, and Maryland cannot tax it out of existence. So therefore, the federal government in McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819 Supreme Court case, said that the federal government has more power than the states because of the supremacy clause and the proper implied powers, a whole bunch of shit. So there's a Supreme Court case that also, you know, pokes a hole at this stupid, dumb, just Allen v. Cooper, 2020 Allen v. Cooper case. So what are we talking about? What is this, you know, Allen v. Cooper? So it's Frederick Allen. He's got a hook for a left hand, so he's Captain Hook. So Captain Hook, he had an oxygen tank exploded, blew off his left hand. It happened 13 years after he did deep scuba diving for the Blackbeard pirate ship. And, and then it was in his garage. So it had nothing to do with his, you know, scuba diving, but it is an unfortunate accident. Now, SCOTUS just kills this case. There's articles written about it in 2019, so no telling how long... Frederick Allen has been working on this case with only one hand. So, 1996, we discover Blackbeard's flagship sunken pirate ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. Old Blackbeard, right? Or you got Captain Hook, who was sitting there taking video, you know, cameras of them raising Blackbeard's ship up. So, Blackbeard is, you know, one, and then Captain Hook. So, you have the Queen Anne's Revenge. Forty cannons, 300 men plundered the high seas with, you know, this pirate Blackbeard. But Blackbeard himself is going to get shot, stabbed, decapitated, not going to have a pretty ending. But for a while, he's going to sail the Queen Anne's Revenge, just murdering and pillaging and raping. He's got 40 cannons, 300 men, Blackbeard, 
North Carolina is going to have festivals, festivities for this notorious, terrible, I think, I'm going to assume he's a pirate, probably rapist, but definitely, you know, warmonger, and uh, I, I've never heard anything good about Blackbeard, but I don't know really much about him except for this case. So, the Queen Anne's Revenge, it's ran in the ground in 1718, Blackbeard's dead, and it stays down there for 280 years. So after 280 years, they discover Blackbeard's ship, his pirate ship, the flagship, the main ship that he used, Queen Anne's Revenge. So it's discovered, and it was discovered by Intersol, Incorporated. So a corporation discovered Blackbeard's sunken ship off the coast of North Carolina. Intersol, I-N-T-E-R-S-A-L, Incorporated, Intersol, Incorporated looked at the laws and said that North Carolina owned Blackbeard's ship. So therefore, they made a deal with the state of North Carolina where they contracted Intersol, the state did, to recover the ship. And then Intersol, being contracted by the state in turn, contracted Frederick Allen, a local v videographer, to document the operation. So he is a contractor of a contractor from the original source, which is, which is the state. Now, they might try to say the state paid for it, so therefore it's hit their property, but they didn't argue that. They said that they're above the law. They got sovereign immunity, and the Supreme Court, you know, went ahead and said, yes, Frederick Allen, a local videographer with only a hook for a left hand, is, does not have any rights that, you know, are guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. So he, for 20 years, with considerable risk to himself, deep diving, scuba diving, you know, video, just all the, for tw copywriting his work the whole time, making sure he's covering his, you know, butt, passing, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, just top, nick, you know, tip top shake, just everything on the, the up and up. Then North Carolina, the state just said, you know what, we're going to use his videos on our YouTube channel because fuck him, right? Fuck him and fuck his copyright claims. And North Carolina is going to be, you know, is going to win. So North Carolina posted his videos online without his permission, without paying him. In 2013, North Carolina is going to admit that one video they should have paid him for, gave him $15,000, but they never paid him for any of the other copyrighted videos and material that they used of his. And then eventually they're going to pass a state law retroactively covering their asses. So not only are you going to have this bullshit being leveled against Frederick Allen, but the legislature, North Carolina's legislature, they're going to go ahead and pass Blackbeard's law. And they're going to cover their asses saying that, you know, anything historical they own or some shit. So to say, basically to deal with this, you know, Frederick Allen thing, because it was getting tied up in federal court. So they was like, hey, we'll go ahead and, you know, cover the asses of North Carolina for posting Frederick Allen's videos on their YouTube channel. So, yeah, the Commerce Clause, that abrogates the sovereign immunity, the Bill of Rights, the, let's see, what else? Bill of Rights, the Supremacy Clause, the Commerce, the Bankruptcy Clause, Post Office Clause, Supremacy Necessary and Proper Clause, Oh, yeah, and the Patent Clause, the Patent and Copyright and Intellectual Property Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. The Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Unless, of course, you know, the state steals Disney's, or think about all the corporations, all individuals and corporations, the state can rob anybody and everybody of their intellectual property because of Alan V. Cooper, this 2020 SCOTUS, which you have the liberal Elena Kagan writing the decision, so therefore you're supposed to say, well, you know, that's totally cool. I think Elena Kagan has overstepped her. She wants Roe v. Wade upheld so much that she's pretending that precedent is the only thing that she cares about. Precedent, precedent, precedent for 26 years. Supreme Court case has been very, very consistent for at least two decades. Oh, yeah, well, in 1819, McCulloch v. Maryland. Let's talk about this for a little bit. So this Supreme Court case 
It's going to say that the federal government has the power to institute a Bank of the United States, and they can plop it down in Maryland, Colorado, Utah, Hawaii, and Maryland and the U.S. states cannot tax any of the federal institutions that the United States government plops in their state out of existence. So basically, the federal government wins. The federal government says we're going to have, you know, these kinds of buildings, this kind of education, this kind of post office. That's exactly, you have to allow them, you cannot tax the post office out of existence. So Bank of the United States, we don't have, we got the Federal Reserve, which acts like the Bank of the United States, but we can't audit it, and there's, we're very limited with the Federal Reserve. So Alexander Hamilton wanted the Bank of the United States. Thomas Jefferson said that the Bank of the United States had no constitutional authority, and Madison at first was against it. So they're going to have the first U.S. Bank. This is about the second U.S. Bank. <clears throat> The first U.S. bank is chartered in Philadelphia, 1791, under George Washington, the first president. But Madison isn't going to renew the first U.S. bank's charter, and it's going to die in 1811. So it was in existence for 20 years, the first U.S. bank, and then it just dies. And then 1816, five years later, Madison changes his mind, and he signs the second U.S. bank back into law, because you had the War of 1812 to pay for. So he had to pay for the War of 1812, the debt, and therefore we need the U.S. bank, and we need to start taxing Americans and getting the money and all that. So now the, Madison is going to sign U.S. bank back into law. It's a Congress passed law. Madison signs it, and then they plop it down in Maryland. Hence, 1819, McCulloch v. Maryland. So, bank charters, taxes, power struggle between the state's federal government. Lots of fun elements here. Congress passed an act in 1816. The second bank of the U.S. is put down a branch. It's put into Maryland. Maryland's pissed off. They pass a law. The state of Maryland, right? This is back when it was just a, collect, a confederacy of states and not a union of states. So Maryland passes a law putting a $15,000 annual tax on all of the out-of-state banks, any foreign banks in Maryland. There was only one out-of-state bank at the time. That was the second bank of the United States. So they're going to tax the second bank of the U.S. $15,000. So, you know, bravo to Maryland to thinking that they had the power, but McCulloch v. Maryland says they don't have the power. McCulloch refuses to pay Maryland's tax because it was illegal. It was unconstitutional. They're not allowed to do that. Maryland sues McCulloch, and they had won at first. But then it goes to the Supreme Court. And yes, the U.S. Constitution allows for the creation of a bank of the United States. And no, Maryland and the United States cannot tax any of the federal institutions out of existence. Lil John, as Mr. Beat says, Chief Justice John Marshall explained implied powers, necessary and proper supremacy clause. So he's saying even though Congress and, you know, all the powers that Congress and the President, all their powers are specifically spelled out in the Constitution because of the necessary and proper clause, anything that they believe is necessary and proper for the proper, you know, and necessary institution of government amongst the American people, they have that power to do too. So they have implied powers. And part of the U.S. Bank to deal with taxes and the money of the government, it seems like there's a logical consensus implied. Is it necessary and proper? Yeah, if it's instituted, you know, with the, the books always being open and it's democratically elected and it's, you know, is democratized. So the U.S. Bank law is fine. Wait, what? <laughs> Chief John Marshall, he had a quote, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And so the Maryland can't tax the U.S. Bank. The U.S. Bank law that Congress passes is fine. The federal government upholds the federal government's institutions. Right? The federal courts upheld the power of the federal government to override the state government. Big shock of the federal court sided with the federal government over the states, but Maryland can't tax the U.S. Bank. Federal laws are supreme over a state law. So because of the Constitution, we have the patent law, and then they passed some 1992 law. 
So not only do you have the Constitution on the side of Frederick Allen, not only do you have the U.S. Constitution, but you also have a Congress passed law in 1990, Papa Bush. So George W. H. W. Bush is going to sign uh, the 1990 Copyright Remedy Clarification Act. This is going to be overruled or some shit, Judicial Review, Marbury v. Madison. But Congress, the legislature, they pass a patent law. The U.S. Constitution says they have a right to pass patent laws. But somehow, the 1990 Copyright Remedy Clarification Act is going to get struck down. And because it gets struck down, this is going to start this avalanche of this uh, judicial push, this overthrow, this coup d'etat of precedent. You want to talk about precedent? We had a copyright law for 200, 300 years in this country, and then 20 to 30 years. So the precedent overwhelming the people by saying, well, you know, the slaves. And the, it, it comes down to if it's good law or bad law. It's only 20 fucking years. You're going to say the precedent of 20 years overrides two to 300 years? It doesn't seem like those court cases, they were trying to overturn public opinion about it, but they're just kind of, you know, meandering out loud. And then people are like, wait a second, maybe there's something here. Now there's something there because the 2020 Allen v. Cooper, this is, you know, the Roberts Court, Elena Kagan, unanimous decision, incredible, unanimous decision, unanimous. Is it okay for North Carolina to steal your intellectual property, whether you're a corporation or an individual, and can you sue them in federal courts? They're, it's okay for them to do it. You have to use their own courts to sue them, and of course, the state courts are going to defend the state power of, you know, infinite, infinite, absolute, sovereign, immune power <laughs> to do anything and everything, immunity. That goes against the rule of law. Fucking immunity. Nobody, nothing has immunity in America. Nothing, nobody has immunity in a democracy. Get the, what are, this, North Carolina retroactively passes laws. So the whole legislature is involved in this conspiracy. They all conspired against Frederick Allen to fuck him out of his, what, how much money do you think, 100000 Pay him his 100000 How much did all the, it cost them millions of dollars to fight this case, but they, just to save $100,000. Breyer, Stephen, Stephen Breyer, I think Justice Breyer, he even mentioned state to pirate copyrighted materials should pay for which they plundered. But he's going to concur anyways. Because, you know, his hands are tied. Starry decisis. Starry decisis. All that Latin phrase. Any old Latin phrase, you know, quid pro quo. If you just say a Latin phrase, you automatically, that's the law of the land. Any random ass Latin phrase, Elena Kagan, what is she doing? You know, she thinks that, what, precedent, love and precedent is going to make them love Roe v. Wade anymore. No, those conservative justices are just Biden time. They'll go ahead and, uh, you know, overturn Roe v. Wade if they have a good bill. So, admitted that Congress explicitly passed uh, legislation. So, Elena Kagan knows about that, you know, Congress passed the 1990 patent law. There's a, I don't know if she knows about the Constitution, the patent clause in the, you know, Constitution. But she says, you know, for 26 years, the federal courts have been fucking over the individuals and corporations whose intellectual property is robbed by the Leviathan, the all-powerful Leviathan state, which has a monopoly of violence and they can do no wrong, right? There's some Latin phrase, the king can do no wrong. That's actually the unitary vision of government, right? Nixon, if the president does it, it's not illegal. He didn't get in trouble for any of his shit. So, Elena Kagan says, to reverse precedent, a justification over and above the belief that the precedent was wrongly decided. It's got to be big time. No, it's just got to be the right decision. Quit making the wrong decisions, Elena Kagan. Alan offers us nothing special at all. Oh, is she, Elena Kagan wanted something special? Then we, just to get justice. That's, you know, justice is kind of special in this time, in this post-Trump, this post-Truth era. SCOTUS cases... These cases offer, they need something special, right? Uh, just to waste their time during a pandemic. They want to, you know, just the little people. We don't want these little, you know, problems of the little people. Come on. We need a nice, powerful, just something that kind of just rocks our socks. This just was not a sexy case. It was boring. And we hated th thinking about it or talking about it. You know, Jesus Christ. 
Uh, Clarence Thomas actually mentioned something. He even questioned whether copyrights are even property with the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. Are copyrights even property? So Clarence Thomas seems to be completely ignorant about the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> and something about the 14th Amendment, is it even property? They argued that it was property under the 14th Amendment. Well, just argue that it's property by the U.S. Constitution and the 1990 law. You got a, a federal code and a federal constitution. What are they, how can they sit there and say anything is above the federal code or the federal constitution? This was probably poorly argued. The lawyer on this case was just terrible. I think it'd be somewhat instructive to talk about the 11th Amendment and then, um, yeah, and then I'll come back. So, the 11th Amendment reads, the judicial power of the U.S. should not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. So, the way that that literally reads says that you can sue your own state. But there's going to be some Supreme Court case that says, no, you can't. But that says that the judicial power of the U.S. shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity. So the federal government cannot issue criminal cases, criminal charges, or civil cases, or civil charges against anybody, against any of the United States, if it's levied by the citizens of another state or the citizens or subjects of any foreign state. No arguments there. Citizens and subjects of any, you know, German citizens cannot sue Americans. I'm okay with that. Citizens and subjects of, you know, um, China, uh, Russia, they cannot sue the American government or any of the individual states by, you know, the Constitution. I'm okay with that. The problem I got a problem with, the problem I have with the 11th Amendment is both it limits the individual's right to use the federal courts to sue other states. So, me residing in Colorado right now, I cannot sue this Texas or Arkansas or Ohio state governments via the federal courts because of the fucking 11th Amendment. And then the Supreme Court even extends this 11th Amendment to say, no, 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 the structure of the whole Constitution implies sovereign immunity. We're a democracy. That implies well, there is no sovereign fucking immunity. The rule of law applies, which means everybody is accountable to the law to give immunity to anybody. Maybe they do it in court cases to get a testimony from something. But just to give people sweeping immunity, sovereign immunity, that's an absolute power. Power. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And they also want to mention that there's only like six or seven cases because they don't uphold this. So what happens when the state government robs you of your intellectual property? You can take it to the state courts, but there's, you know, no reports. It's not like they did any studies of this. But just thinking about a library. A library has all those DVDs that they check out, right? So that's, you know, so libraries, archives, you know, I think that they probably could get, you know, excluded out of the thing. I don't know exactly what I believe when it comes to patent law, copyright, or should we even have this stuff, but it is constitutional. And precedent for two to three hundred years has been consistently that it's okay for Congress to pass patent laws and copyright law, and the Constitution protects that right for them to do so. So this, you know, the Eleventh Amendment is terrible. I hate the idea that you can't sue other states or your own state. So I believe the way that the 11th Amendment reads it says that you can sue your own state. I could sue Colorado for if they injure me through the federal courts, but I can't sue Texas if their state, you know, injured me somehow. And so I can't sue Arkansas or California. That's the 11th Amendment passed in response to Chisholm v. Georgia, and Chisholm v. Georgia said that states don't have sovereign immunity. So the 11th Amendment passed in response to Chisholm v. Georgia, therefore overturning the idea. So the 11th Amendment strongly implies that there's sovereign immunity. The, I don't believe, I don't understand the argument of the structure of the whole Constitution implies sovereign immunity. That's fucking bullshit. 
So, because amendments, that you could change the damn thing and you could rewrite a brand new constitution. It's not, the constitution itself is not sacrosanct. It's been around for a long time. That's why when it says that you have patent law, <laughs> I mean, I feel like...